Good evening, and thank you for being here. We're going to give everyone a little time to filter into our room, and we will get started in just a minute. A few things I will point out to you while everybody's joining us. We're going to have Q&A session at the end. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen there is a Q&A box. So if you'd like to um, submit any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to do so. Um, you can add those there at any time and we'll make sure that we try to get through as many of those as we're able to. We've got a lot that we've got planned for you today, so I'm sure people will still be joining us, but I think to make sure we get through as much as we can, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, thanks for being here tonight for How We Watch Movies Now. I am so excited about this program and the people that we're going to be presenting to you today. Um, you've seen me work possibly in the past with David Gaines. This is our third program together. And it's always an honor to work with him. Um, let me introduce them all to you today. First, uh, like I said, we have Professor Emeritus of English, Dr. Gaines. He fancies himself a bit of a Bob Dylan, uh, what Bob Dylan once called a song and dance man. He grew up in Grand Prairie, Texas, went to California in the 60s, and law school in the 70s, and has, and has been in the groves of academia ever since. He's taught American literature, film, and music at Harlem, at the University of Texas at Austin, and at, the, and at Southwestern University. Here at Southwestern, he believed that through encountering, examining, discussing, and writing about a wide variety of texts, from canonical literature to products of popular culture to contemporary events, students and he would become more effective critical thinkers and more fully engaged citizens. One of the primary goals in all of his classes in advising was to wed the heart and the head and to see what, uh, how to create connections between what we think, feel, and do. He and his wife, Norma, who also retired from Southwestern, have four children and live here in Georgetown, Texas. Um, the programs that I've worked on with David Gaines um, are not available on recording because they contain clips that we don't have the rights to. However, I do have those recordings if you wish to see them. Just email me or reach out to me on the Whoba app and I can provide those to you. It is also my pleasure to introduce Tabika Sihi. She's an Associate Professor of Business at Southwestern University. She earned her PhD in Marketing at the McCombs Business School um, at the University of Texas in Austin. She also holds a BBA and MPA from the McCombs School. Prior to entering the doctoral program, she worked at Public Strategies, Inc. And, and Deloitte, both multinational professional services and consulting firms. Her research explores techno technological innovations and disruptions in the field of marketing. She's published works in peer-reviewed marketing and business journals, including the Journal of Marketing, Theory and Practice, Industrial Marketing Management, Journal of Research and Interactive Marketing, and the Journal of at Academy and Marketing Science. Ibika teaches a variety of business courses, including classes on digital marketing and a capstone co course with a focus on innovative innovation in business, and is a beloved professor of many students. Ibika actively participates and assists with different in initiatives in the Austin startup and entrepreneurship communities. And she's also an avid supporter of Emancipet and Animal Welfare Organization. And it's also a delight to work with Sean Pippen West. She and I have tried to work before in the past, but her busy schedule prevented that from happening. So I'm delighted to be able to work with her today. She has been a, a DGA member since 2004 as a working first um, assistant director in the entertainment industry. She's now transitioning to episodic streaming director. Her short film directorial debut, Mo, is currently making the film festival circuit and has been selected and won several awards. Some of her AD credits include Dream Girls, Longest Yard, Family Stone, Beyond the Lights, a few things you may have heard of. 
And her TV credits include HBO Max's West Wing special Benefit for When We All Vote, which just won a DGA award, Disney Plus Big Shot, ABC's Grey's Anatomy, The Catch, For the People, Fox's Shots Fired, NBC's Community, Netflix Friday Night Lights, Raising, Raising Dion, which I loved, and Sorry for Your Loss from Facebook. As a graduate of the Director's Guild Producer Training Program, um, she has been very active in the Guild, is on the Board of Trustees, the DGA National Board as an alternate, um, Diversity Task Force, the Education Committee, and has been on the 80 UPM Council West as a member and or alternate from 2013 to the president. Oh, and by the way, she is a two-time Director Guild Award winner. So please join me in welcoming them for this fantastic program. Thank you, Serena. Um, I'm gonna lead off here and just like Serena said, welcome all of you to the room uh, and thank you for being with us tonight. And also uh, wish you the best, your families, your friends, uh, your community. I hope you're all doing well through this time that's uh, very challenging. And I and all my colleagues I know look forward to seeing you at the next homecoming in the same literal rather than virtual room. So let me start a little bit before uh, the rest of my panelists share a bit with you too, by saying the title that we landed upon, How We Watch Movies Now, is a bit of a repurposing of uh, Anthony Trollope's The Way We Live Now. And you can kind of fill in the blank to that great title, The Way We Blank Now. But the way we watch movies now in this particular cultural and uh, industry moment uh, seemed like something that's worth pursuing. The description, uh, if I could see that slide with F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, the description that we provided had a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, not that one, that's not F. Scott, but there's F. Scott Fitzgerald. He did do PowerPoints, but we'll go with this quote. Uh, and we use that in our description uh, because it teases out a few things that I think are worth playing with. Not half a dozen men, sick, have ever been able to keep the whole equation of pictures in their heads. He wrote that in a book called The Last Tycoon about Irving Thalberg, a famous uh, and very powerful uh, studio presence in America in the 1920s and 30s. The whole, the sick is in there because now as we will hear particularly uh, when Sean talks, it's not just men in Hollywood. Uh, it's, it was much more in those days, Fitzgerald's. But the whole equation is the other part of it I like a lot. And I think we all felt that's an interesting notion. How do we get the whole equation of anything, whether it be pictures, whether it be uh, higher education, whether it be uh, police reform, what have you. And we thought uh, that one of the best ways to go at that, absolutely, Serena, you got it. Uh, one of the best ways to go at that was through a conversation akin to all those Paideia conversations that we have been having over the years, where people from different disciplines and different experiences bring their lenses to a shared conversation about a topic and you talk synergy, we see what comes out of those different lenses. And I think we get a better sense of the whole equation if we go that way. And then finally, I would like to propose uh, before we begin uh, hearing the real substantive stuff that we landed on this notion that the whole equation might be described as the sum of production, which Sean's gonna talk about, distribution, which Dabika's going to talk about, and reception, which I am. And I would just like to throw out there just to keep in mind for later on, uh, let's see what it all adds up to. I mean, what is production plus distribution plus reception add up to in, at this moment in time? So 
Uh, that's an unpacking of the thinking behind uh, this gathering. And I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Sean Pipkin West. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gaines. And I'd like to also thank Dr. Sihi and Serena for inviting me to participate in this event. Thank you to Southwestern and all who are attending virtually. After Serena's wonderful introduction of Dr. Sihi and Gaines, I've always thought I was an overachiever, but now I feel like an underachiever listening to everything they have done. <laughs> but I am so happy to be here. And, um, and again, my name is Sean Pipkin West, class of 1994. And I am going to talk about how we watch movies now, uh, mainly the production. Um, at one point, I was thinking about talking about how production has changed with COVID. But to myself, I wanted to focus on something positive because I'm hoping that we do not have to always wear masks and always stay six feet uh, apart when we are, uh, you know, when we're filming, when we're in production. So I'm more going to talk about. Um, production as far as, and if we could please uh, put up the first slide there. Serena, thank you. Uh, people, places, and purpose. So let's go to the next si slide, please. Okay, so people. Um, this is um, about in front of the camera, in front of the lens, and also behind. Representation, diversity, and inclusion, and gender parity. An awakening of audience <clears throat> that demands to see themselves in front and behind the camera has really been in the last uh, four years, last four or five years, has really been the forefront of our industry. And I would like to show, if we can go to the next slide, please. Just giving an example of this year's Academy Awards. Um, they are they are later this year, they are later this month, April 28th. Normally they are in February, obviously because of the pandemic um, and they are trying to do it in person this year. We'll see what happens within the next uh, couple of weeks. But if you guys can see this year, looking at uh, many of the films who've been recognized by the Academy, not necessarily for just directing or acting, but you know, for, for screenplay, you see best animated, and you can see how diverse and how multicultural, multi-ethnic um, th these um, projects have been. And a big reason for that is there has been a major demand for many, underrepresented communities want, wanting to see themselves and also the market realizing that there was a huge audience that was was lacking um you know lacking entertainment and that just really wanted it wanted to see themselves represented historically and also with just the fantasy and fiction um people want more diversity people want more gender parity. And it's also good for business, which I know uh, Dr. C. He is going to go into later. Um, and people just want to see themselves represented because you the, the saying goes, you cannot be what you cannot see. So who's making these stories? Everyone has a story to tell, but not everyone has had an opportunity for the masses to see their stories. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So you can see these are um, a few of the actors that have been nominated this year for their works that they have done in feature films. Um, and, and as you can see, like, like major diversity. In 2015, there was um, a huge push. There was a hashtag that was going around and really um, there was a huge push. It was called Oscars So White because there was such, there were so many films that were so ethnically diverse. And then when it came to them being recognized in the Academy Awards, it was everybody was like, where, where are the nominations? Why are these people not being recognized? Well, the Academy heard this. And as you can see, we have um, from Judas and the Black uh, Messiah, we have Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Minari, uh, the United States versus Billie Holiday. Um, you know, and you have uh, Riz, Riz Ahmed, who is the first Muslim actor to be nominated for best actor in uh, the Academy Awards. Um, and uh, if we can go to the next slide. And now behind the camera, this year we have 
two women that are nominated for Oscars. Um, on the left, those of you who don't know, that is Emerald Fennell. She wrote and directed Promising Young Woman. Uh, in the middle is Chloe Zhang, who, um, oh, I am so sorry, Chloe Zhao, sorry, uh, that uh, wrote and directed Nomadland. And so far, if, if I were a betting person for the Oscars, she's probably going to win because she has won the Golden Globes, she has won the DGA Award and uh, for Best Feature Film Director. And historically, in the last 40 years, all but two directors who have won the DGA Award has gone on to win the Academy Award for Best Director. So she has pretty good chances. And then on the right, we have Lee Isaac Chung, who wrote and directed, um, who wrote and directed Minari. Now, um, with what has happened this year with the pandemic, many people staying at home, a lot of these movies probably would not have been uh, viewed by as many uh, as, as the major population. But because of streaming, this, uh, these movies were given a huge audience. And I know Dr. Sahi is gonna go into more of that, but um, me personally, I believe that Promising Young Woman would not have been getting the recognition that it has today if it weren't for the streaming and for everybody being at home and distributors deciding for us, since we can't go into movie theaters, we need to make this more accessible um, for featuring. And um, a, a lot of the movies um, that are being recognized, many people relate to what's going on in these movies. People wanna relate to what's happening. Nomad land, loss, profound loss. Last year, so many of us, we've been through collective trauma. So many people have had loss, whether it's loss of lives, whether it's loss of jobs, <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, loss of homes. You talk about um, Minari, the American dream, providing for your family, hardship, um, and you, you and you talk about. Um, uh, uh, Promising Young Woman, where it was about, and you know, I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts, but just how this world treats, how, you know, the, this world treats women, uh, how traumatic uh, life has been and how it's been trivialized and how just, it just affects every, every thread in, in our lives. Um, and then you go into uh, movies like, um, Judas and the uh, Black Messiah about Chairman Fred Hampton, about poverty, about revolution, about activism, United States versus um, United States versus Billie Holiday, about activism. A lot of people did not realize that the government was trying to stop her from performing her song "Strange Fruit" because it was it was putting an eye and a spotlight on the lynchings that were going on specifically in the Deep South. And so these are things that, you know, people want to see. And these are people that are bringing this um, to, to, the, to the forefront. People are having stories. More stories are being told. More stories, more, more um, platforms are able to, 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 to uh, display and distribute these stories, which I know Dr. C is going to go into. And even though many people are, are being given a chance um, to show more stories, there still is not enough equity. And if we could go to the next frame. So these, uh, these uh, stats here are for feature films, just so everybody knows. And this is from the Directors Guild of America's research. And um, I wish that I was able to, to get more um, current numbers, but if you can see how the, the numbers have been rising since 2009, but when you, and also just so everybody knows, this is, these are only uh, Directors Guild directors. There are many directors out there that are not in our guild that are not union. So this is specifically about Directors Guild. Um, right now there's about 18,000 director, director members, director, Directors Guild members, and about 14,000 of those are actual directors. So you see first time women hiring is, uh, is, is, is going up. There was a slight dip in 2014, um, but it's going up now. Um, but the, even though it looks like there is much, much progress, 
but the majority of directors being hired are white men to be to you know to just be honest about it so um so let's move on to the next slide please so now um we're going to places so before the 2000s the majority of feature films were either done in los angeles california or they were done in new york new york city surrounding areas but since the 2000s in the united states um, with, you know, it's called runaway production. A lot of states have been giving incentives for productions to come. And so Georgia is number one in feature film production in the United States. Uh, second is New Mexico, Louisiana, and California, New York. Now, and I just want to emphasize, these are feature films. When it comes to television, California is still the lead but there's very few feature films being done in California right now. And so uh, when now we go domestic, I mean, I'm sorry, foreign films, India makes, uh, a, produces about close to 2000 features, um, 2000 features a year. Um, Nigeria with their um, industry is run uh, by the state and they are a short second, and then USA and China and Japan. And these are all about, this is all about production. This is about producing films. This isn't necessarily about the market that takes it in. And I know that's what Dr. C is gonna go into, but I'm talking about like how, how films are being feed, uh, produced, just so everybody is aware of that. Um, and um, so that is uh, about places. So we've done people, places, and let's go to the next one please. Okay, so now purpose. So I looked up the few quotes by a few famous people you guys may know, maybe not. Uh, Peter Jackson, those of you who don't know, is the uh, director, producer responsible for the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. And uh, so he said the most honest form of filmmaking is to make a film for yourself. Because if you if you like it, then pretty sure a lot of other people are going to like your film. Oscar Wilde said, life imitates art far more than art imitates life. Life imitates art far more than art imitates life. So it's very important what we're putting on the screen. It's very, very important what we're putting on the screen. We can change the world by what we put out there. And uh, Steven Spielberg, you know, a little, you know, little known uh, director, right? Uh, he said, the public has an appetite for anything about imagination, anything that is as far away from reality as is creatively possible. This quote resonated with me so much because um, I do like to escape. <laughs> I do not personally like documentaries because I'm like, that's reality. I just want to escape and I just want to not think about anything and I just want to watch and enjoy film. But there are a lot of people who are not like that. They want realism. Um, they, they love documentaries and, um, and there you go. But there's plenty for everybody. And thank you very much. And now we will go to the wonderful Dr. C. My gosh, thank you. It's hard to follow someone that often. I was sharing a story earlier that I was telling my class today. I get to be sandwiched in between David and Sean. It's like rock star one and rock star two. And here I am in the middle talking about film distribution. So I will try to go fast so we can get to the second main event quickly. But it is important because I'm um, thinking about production and then how does that movie get released? So I'm excited to talk a little bit about this. And I will tell you some of my students inspired my interest in this. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the second slide. But really in the constraint of time and to keep my thoughts organized, we're gonna look at three sort of channels of distribution. The movie theater, so AMC, Tinsel Town, where you go to enjoy a movie or at least used to pre-COVID. And then streaming services, which maybe five years ago, there was Netflix, then Amazon Prime came on the market. Now I can't fit enough of them on a slide because there are just so many streaming services. As Sean said, these services have given sort of a voice to maybe movies and actors that otherwise wouldn't have made the main screen. 
it's interesting how growing competition in this is also a little bit at tension with the movie theaters themselves. And then the drive-in, the resurgence of the drive-in very much last year, but one that I'm curious to see if that will stay. So a couple of things that are driving where we watch movies. And so we move it to the second one. Hopefully you can see this. I wanted to talk about four factors. The revenue model. I'm a business professor. I have to talk about a revenue model. But where does um, really the movie get, how the movie gets shown is determined a lot by the revenue model. What's interesting is box office sales still make up so much of the global revenue for movie studios. So when a studio releases a movie and it goes to AMC or Tinsel Town, about 46% of its global revenue comes from those box office sales. And that number is actually up from 2000 when it was 26%. So box office sales are still very important. In terms of revenue share, the movie studio keeps about 55% of it. And the movie theaters, the AMC, keep about 45%. So that's what the revenue split looks like. What's interesting is almost 75% of that global revenue, at least in the United States, comes within the first 17 days of the movie releasing. So that impacts what we call the release window. The theatrical release window is how long is that movie going to stay in the theater? So we can get into the AMC and see it right when it releases. If it's a Marvel movie, maybe you're going to see it multiple times just to see what you missed last time. So the release window, interestingly enough, has on average, and I'm going to draw for some research that uh, four senior business capstone students do. I can't not acknowledge them. They're the first reference down there. Mason Beggars, Madison Delmer, Jaden Hughes, and Tanmai Korapala, four amazing students who looked at movie theaters for their research project. And they wanted to understand sort of what changes are we seeing? And one of them was this release window. So the release window in 2017, that's the most recent date I saw, was about 94 days, so around three months. On average, if you looked over years up till 2020, it varied anywhere from 75 days to 95 days. But that has slowly been shrinking and movies are going to streaming just a little bit faster. After COVID hit last year, there were some unprecedented changes to the release window. And we saw Paramount and AMC actually strike a deal, and Sean probably knows this even better than I do, for a 17-day release window, a very short release window from which it went to streaming. Sean mentioned sort of the spillover effects that happen, and Dr. Gaines mentioned the whole equation. It very much works like that for distribution. There's a domino effect. Depending how well a movie does in the movie theater can impact the windows further down. So from after it leaves the theater to premium, uh, at home streaming, then to basic cable. So how long does it have exclusive rights in each of those different release formats? And what are those different license fees like at each level? So there's a domino effect. And it's interesting, we were just talking, we've seen that because of the closed theaters, some of the theater chains are not doing as well. So unfortunately, two days ago, and Sean's in California, so she can probably give you a better ground level view. But we saw a large theater chain in the uh, California base, Pacific Light, actually announced that it was going to close 300 of its locations, including the iconic Dome Theater on Sunset Boulevard. So people are upset that this is not about gloom and doom. It's just about a moment of change. And so we're seeing some of these changes that were happening but COVID accelerated them. What's interesting is a lot of this is driven by our behavior as consumers. And I know that Dr. James is gonna talk a little bit more about our movie experience, so I won't steal his thunder, but what drove a lot of it last year and what will continue to drive it, I think for the next couple of years is the environment, like where you will choose to watch the movie. And so the primary research done by the students and some great research that Deloitte and some of the reporters the Wall Street Journal have found is that people are really anxious about what is that first time back at the theater going to be like and what will it continue to be like. So the National Association of Theater Owners actually put together something called Cinema Safe, Cinema Safe. 
which was a list of protocols for how the movie experience would be different. So in that channel, there is now a lot more mobile tickets. You don't have concession stands in the same way. There's new air filtration systems. Obviously, small independently owned theaters may not be able to do this, but some of the larger chains are thinking about those behavioral changes. And in recent surveys, so surveys done in 2021 in the past two months compared to last year when people were more uncertain, more and more people are saying, oh, we're ready to get out. We really want to do some stuff in the theater and have that experience. So there is hope, I think, for those channels in the movie theater. Streaming continues to grow. I think um, Netflix hit a huge mark in subscribers just a month ago, but we're seeing that people want both. And then the drive-in. So my students researched a local drive-in operator and found that his income actually tripled during the pandemic. So the drive-in, little known fact, was created in 1933 by a man in New Jersey whose mom actually didn't like the seats in movie theaters. She found them uncomfortable created, lo and behold, the first drive-in, and it grew in popularity in the 50s and 60s. What happened, though, is land became more scarce. That land that stayed idle during the day became pretty attractive for real estate developers, and the advent of VCR technology meant people had more choices for how they could watch TV. But last year, we saw a resurgence. So it'll be interesting to see, when I talk about alternative experiences, if people continue to frequent the drive-in, the other thing we're seeing is some of the theaters themselves, so AMC Tinseltown, changed the experience. You can have private party screenings and also to think about their channel as movies, but also something else. We were seeing AMC do gaming nights with the growth of esports along with the movie. You may be able to engage in the movie theater in some sort of esports activity. So new uses for the theater along with movies. So that, I think, is my leadoff point because all of these changes and all of these models are being driven by us, the consumer and the movie viewer who's deciding which channel to use and how to consume content. So I think with that, I will stop sharing and, lead and um, give it back to David. Okay, I just put my microphone back on and I trust we hear me. And uh, if you would please pull up that first slide, Serena, that would be great. My quantitative slide of uh, graphs. While that slide is getting to us, I felt like I was hearing, hmm, not as I recall it, but that's okay. Uh, let me just say, as both these guys were talking. I was hearing uh, David Bowie in the background in my head that we should have had changes running uh, as our soundtrack. The graph that I wanted to pull up was I started thinking about what has changed over time and particularly this last year when I was going, thank you, Serena. Uh, and this is one of my rare moments of uh, pulling up bar graphs. Uh, so those of you who know me, uh, I'm trying to do lifelong learning here. Uh, but it started dawning on me as uh, the Alamo Draft House went bankrupt, as we watched more and more at home, as people started uh, talking more about platforms than about studios, that uh, to quote Bob Dylan, you didn't need to be a weatherman to know which way the wind was blowing. So this is a year ago, a little less than a year ago. And what we can see is uh, increasingly, and it's only gone up, I'm sure, during the pandemic, that people would prefer uh, to watch movies at home uh, to going to a theater. I hope that's gonna change again and come back a bit. We'll see what's on the other side, but let's go to the next slide to the so what of that. What difference does that make? At our house, uh, maybe like some of your houses, uh, we check out Turner Classic Movies a good bit. That's our uh, kind of, uh, our gestalt often. And Turner started years ago with this mission statement that they wanted to 
be both curators and contextualists. And I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than these. In fact, I'm older than both these guys combined, but who's counting? Uh, I think for a certain generation, a certain group of people under the big tent, what Turner puts on, what they look at. And as I, as I listen to Sean talk about uh, the Oscar nominees, very few of those movies, which I've seen to be truthful, Turner this month is running all of the Oscar winning kind of that they own uh, and finding ways into certain films, performances, directors, music. And it's a fascinating juxtaposition uh, with what's going on now. And it does seem like an, indeed another century, another lifetime. Why that matters, I think, to someone like me and a lot of people, I hope, is that the whole idea of curating, Scorsese had a, a terrific piece in uh, Harper's last month about curation and about what it means to recognize what came before us. And to put that in cultural context, always put that in cultural context. And so Gone with the Wind, we could talk about specific movies, but what it looked like in 1939 compared to what it looks like today, 82 years later, I think that's a good part of a conversation. So I'm happy for Turner. Let's see our next slide, please. And I'll just tell you what I hope for. Uh, you know, lots of people, a little bit outside the industry technically, uh, Sean can probably give me a term, a cool term for who these critics, uh, uh, talking heads about the movies are. But this year, like everything else, you know, what are restaurants gonna be like after the pandemic? What has the pandemic done to restaurants? What has it done to religious services? What has it done to, you name it, picket, family reunions? A.O. Scott wrote a while back that going to a theater, which I miss terribly, as I'm sure many of you do, can mean stepping outside of your comfort zone, pushing against the boundaries of your own taste. Your television exists safely within these boundaries and in the literal comfort zone of your living room. Challenging movies can slide too easily to the bottom of the queue, neglected like unread books on the nightstand, or jars of exotic mustard at the back of the fridge. So, you know, I was gonna bring out a jar of exotic mustard uh, as a visual aid, but I think his point, and I like it, the point well taken is that going into a theater, and, and as, as Dr. C, he said, we're not doing doom and gloom, but I'm feeling a little nostalgia about, and a little uh, loss, well, a lot of loss about going to a movie. Uh, with a group of people. And the next slide, uh, please, Serena, uh, from A.S. Hanna in Harper's. Uh, Harper's had a whole issue in February about fill in the blank after Trump. Uh, you know, what's next? And he says, in a movie theater, you were alone with strangers. Oh, let me read it off my notes because I'm a little blocked. In a movie theater, you were alone with strangers sharing in the communal act of watching shadows on the screen, there was power in that. And I do think, I don't think that's over uh, by any means. And I think there's definitely power. And I, I've learned a lot putting this presentation together with, with Serena and Dr. C and Sean. Uh, and I think I've learned among other things that yes, a lot of these movies probably wouldn't have stood as good a chance that we're seeing now. So, you know, the glass, the glass, I hope is half full. Uh, I'm gonna punt it back to uh, Serena to uh, ride herd on the uh, Q and A. Thank you. We actually did have some questions that had been submitted prior to the presentation, and I know that we have uh, one in our Q&A box. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and get that for you. I know that there are people who've um, had some questions sitting out there for a while. So first one, um, will theaters ever go back to what they were pre-pandemic, or will they become modern versions of bowling alleys? Highly appealing for some, but just 
not part of the mix for most. I think both of these guys are probably uh, better people to bet on than I, but some of the things I've been reading and hearing are that the big blockbuster uh, features, the big special effects features are still gonna be run in theaters because you need that big screen and you've got that built-in audience. The real question in my head, uh, as we talk about something like Alamo going into bankruptcy and smaller venues closing, is what will happen to those uh, more alternative spaces. What do you think, Sean? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I agree, you're absolutely right about the tent pole, you know, uh, features, which are like the Marvels, you know, the big Disney movies. Those will always be, you know, displayed in the, they're going to be displayed in the theaters. That's, that's never going to change. But the smaller, the smaller films, I think the streaming is where, where they're going to go. The, the theaters are still be around, but they're only going to be for the huge hundred, two hundred million dollar blockbuster features that uh, Dr. Gaines was talking about. As they say, Tim Pole, you know, they have, has the, um, the sequels, you know, the every two, three years, you know, you'll, you'll see something like that coming out. I agree. Okay, this next one is um, multi-layers. Uh, How have our viewing patterns via streaming services shaped the landscape of movie production today? They can now measure our viewing history and tastes uh, to much finer detail and see what sorts of things get more clicks. Is this good or bad for cinema and media as a whole? It seems like it might squash out certain kinds of cinematic innovation. They're curious as to what your thoughts are on this. I'd like to, to speak on that because um, I have to say, and I'm gonna specifically um, target Netflix with this. Those of you who know, and like me, I have many people on my Netflix account, right? <laughs> um, so like my husband's account, like the feed, the movies that come up are completely different from what comes up with me. So 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 what does Netflix do? They see they 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 log what you're watching, and then they'll find something specific for you. Oh, this is something that oh I think you'll like. You know, movie theaters they're just like they'll put them up and they'll be like oh I hope somebody I hope they watch it. You know, or it's a regional or it's a regional thing. Um, but that's what's I think with uh, Netflix, because they they are so specific, like they will, they're like, we know this is what you want to see. So that's what's going to first come up. Um, so I think that is definitely changing um, as far as with, with streaming. And, you know, with, with theaters, movies and theaters, you don't get that. You see what's out there, you know. You look, you look online or you just go, like I used to do, I would just go and, hmm, what do I want to see today? Okay, boom. <laughs> you know, so I don't know, Dr. C, do you have anything to add with that? <laughs> I 100% agree with you. And hi, Catherine Buckley. Um, I definitely think that um, it's interesting, it extends to me, like this question was so good when I saw it popped up beyond movies to even like the news that we watch and the news that we're exposed to because you may have a news feed through different channels that you get, but so much of that is driven by the articles that you click. And so to Sean's point, like you're gonna get a lot of the same because Netflix will tell you like the recommender app, like obviously speak to like this type of genre, but you might miss some of the other content that you're not exposed to. And in terms of like journalism, I always think like, what if there's a really important story that's not in my geographic region or not in an area that I'm, but I'll never even be exposed to that. So I think there will be some due diligence that people will have to do. Just like we say, like, look for news in different places. Look for, you'll probably have to do some of that digging or maybe get on your husband's like list and see if there's some other things that aren't being recommended to you. That's probably my two cents. David, I don't know if you feel differently. No, I'm, I'm good with what you guys are saying. I, I don't have anything nearly as smart to add. 
<laughs> there is something that I would like to add, and, and Dr. C, we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, that Netflix is a tech company. They are not, they, they, they consider themselves a tech company. And also with AT&T purchasing Warner Brothers, like now you have a tech company that is, you know, that, that, uh, that owns Warner Brothers. So what is that? That's HBO. <laughs> that's HBO Max. Um, you know, that's WB, uh, CW. Um, <clears throat> So the, the, like you, with Disney and Fox, you know, they still considered, you know, they're still filmmakers, you know, just, you know, now that obviously Disney Plus is exploding um, and they're doing really well, but why did they do that? They did that to keep up with the times. Netflix, by the way, those of you who don't know, Disney is the whole reason Netflix is even in the game. If you guys uh, know that the whole reason that Netflix started their cat their catalog is they bought their Disney's catalog back in I don't know Dr. C do you remember what year it was but I don't know because they were thinking oh streaming that's not going to go anywhere so they like in today's terms like basically for a dollar <laughs> Netflix bought uh Disney's library and so that's how they went and garnered their audience and everything because Netflix was like, oh, you guys, and just like what happened with Blockbuster, Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix when they were just doing DVDs. They didn't think it was anything and we see what happened. <laughs> well, I do wanna just jump in for a, a brief paragraph and say my head explodes when I hear that they're tech companies. Not that I've got anything against tech companies, but I think back to that Scott Fitzgerald quote, at that moment in time in California, the studios were the fourth largest piece of the economy of the state. They weren't a subset of anything. They were, you know, that's a long time ago and change is, is good, but, uh, well, I don't know if it's good, but it's inevitable. Uh, but yeah, tech companies rather than uh, filmmakers, that seems a little, that's a brave new world to me. Um, how do you think this shift to streaming will affect short film? I'll jump in for a second and then I'll turn it over to Sean because we had a we have a lot of conversations in case you can't tell by this. We were <laughs> talking about Quibi, the ultimate short form. So, and I think the four of us were discussing this Monday. To people not familiar, Quibi was going to be short form content on the go. So these like 10 minute quick bites that you could watch while you were waiting for public transportation in between work meetings for your afternoon pick me up. But then the pandemic hit and no one needed a short bite. You needed a bite for all afternoon because you were at home in your pajamas doing Zoom meetings. So it really was the death of Quibi. And what I didn't know and Sean was telling me was, the other part was a technical part. Quibi didn't allow you to cast. Isn't that right, Sean? And so I think that was the second piece. This idea of like short attention span and short form, it's interesting because the pandemic sort of shifted that, but Sean might have more insights on how that will change back now that we're slowly coming out of it. Yeah, for, for short form, I say, you know, short films, streaming, you would think, uh, um, would definitely help uh, reach uh, a bigger audience for for short film directors. Um, but going back to Quibi, like it was just horrible timing with Quibi. I'm telling you, if there was not a pandemic, they they would have exploded. It, it really would have been amazing. Um, and 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 what. Like you said, Dr. C, they did not allow the phone because it was all about phones, right? It was all about your phone. And they did not allow you to cast on a monitor or a TV. Well, if you're stuck at home for six months and you have a 70 inch screen, why would you sit and watch it on TV? And they really messed up with that. But, but then 
to their credit, they were just expecting this to be with people waiting in line at an airplane, you know, in, in, in secure at TSA or waiting to board. That's the, they, you know, people that were traveling, people are sitting in the back of an Uber or Lyft, you know, the, you know, wanting to watch something for like five, 10 minute, um, you know, for five, 10 minute uh, ride or something. And it, it was just horrible timing. And also something else with Quibi, when it first came out, a lot of short film directors like myself were really excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I'll be able to like show my thing. But you know what they did? They went and got all these big time directors like yeah. Spike Lee, Antoine Fuqua, Catherine Hardwick and had them basically do a feature, but they cut it up into like 20 episodes. So filmmakers were like, wait, what? But, <laughs> In their defense, they needed to get the heavy hitters, right? They needed to get the, the, the big time directors, the big time filmmakers when they were straight out of the gate. And I think maybe their model would have changed. Or maybe that, I think that was the whole plan is that to eventually go, you know, with the short form. But um, yeah, so a lot of people were like, wait a minute, you're just basically making a feature and cutting it up into 12 chapters. <laughs> so. Next question. <laughs> we are unfortunately running really close on time. And there's a few questions I definitely want to try to get to. So one of them, um, any advice for talking to a very woke 14 year old about the context for older movies like Gone with the Wind? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first run at that. Uh, I think for a 14 year old, that's perfect. That's my uh, sweet spot. I think we, we talk about that year a little bit, that, that that was at least released. We talk about what was going on in the world around that. Uh, I think we also can always talk about and should talk about gender roles and depictions. Uh, and also I think to ask anyone to be an active participant, ask them to watch for a scene or a moment in the movie that they want to discuss, a representative passage, something they want to talk about. Uh, because it meant, you know, we don't want a movie to be another lecture. We want to go, this is what was going on when this was made. Let's talk about how it looks to us now. And let's talk about a moment that stood out to you that really you loved or it bothered you or uh, you want to discuss. So. I don't know, we're with threes tonight. So I'd say historic, the history around it, the gender that they see going on in it, how do men behave, how do women behave, how do gays behave, how do, you know, blacks behave, how do race, I mean, my God, with Gone with the Wind, how do we not talk about race? But mainly, I think all of that, I just say, we're gonna watch this together and you tell me what scene you liked best or you wanna talk about, what, what, what did you see? It's my two cents. It worked with mixed results with our 14 year olds. <laughs> we did it for years. One summer, Norma had the idea that we would have a film festival at our house with our four kids. And each of us would pick a movie and we would have theme meals with those movies. And it was uh, Balcones Draft House. It was a good thing. I learned a lot. All right, anyone else want to comment or should I go for the next question? Next question, I think he handled that, that okay. was really well. Thank so you. I think this is gonna be the last question and then we'll have time for our panelists to give some closing thoughts. As the movie at home phenomenon, along with cell phones, multitasking and more, destroyed our ability to attend a movie in a theater and perform the traditional role of a polite cinema audience. What are we losing when the traditional audience experience in evolves into something new. I'd like to just talk about theaters and uh, reference to film festivals. Um, film festivals, you know, had to go online last year and are still going online uh, because of the pandemic. And specifically with film festivals, what has changed is that many uh, distributors, many studios, they, like to hear the audience reaction to films. 
that depend you know that is a uh, main um uh, determinant of if they want to, to be distributed for a certain film that is out there. You didn't get that last year. There was no audience. You did not hear the laughter. Or you did not, you know, hear the sniffles of people crying in the theater. Um, and so think about that. That, that has affected many uh, emerging filmmakers that, you know, if it, if it was in the theater and if, if, if distributors and studios were able to, 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 to hear that audience reaction, the results um, of that film becoming a success or not um, totally changed. So that's, that's something that definitely, um, I, I agree. I think it's, you know, theaters, they're going to make a comeback. I, I, I think so. I, really, I hope so. <laughs> that's my two cents. Kabika, you have a thought on that one? Because I do. I'll pass to you. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, I think the last two quotes that I used kind of were nodding in that direction. Uh, I don't think that stuff's gone forever, but I do think endangered are stepping outside our comfort zones, being part of a larger experience. I've been upset as students and anyone who's been trapped in a room with me know, I've been upset about on demand forever. That phrase bothers me. Uh, you know, the whole idea of on demand seems to me like uh, a moving away from community. So I worry about that, but also something we haven't talked about much really is the beauty of that experience. And some of these movies are indeed made to be seen and heard large, not just with people, but you know, uh, a guy named Mark Crispin Miller, uh, a television and film critic came to uh, what we used to call freshman symposium, no, uh, first year colloquium, remember Sean? And Sean's freshman year, Mark Crispin Miller came to campus to speak and he said that looking at Lawrence of Arabia on a VCR was like looking at the Sistine Chapel through a roll of toilet paper. So I think, you know, I love that. So I think, you know, we'll see how it goes, but, but there's something about the largeness, the community, and I'm nostalgic, you guys know that, I, I do. I do trust Sean because I've invested a lot of money on insider trading and she's never done me wrong. Uh, but I do think theaters will come back and I'm just joking about insider trading. Uh, so that's my answer. I'm getting a little punchy. Serena, what's next? All right, well, I just wanna thank everyone uh, for being here. I want to give um, our wonderful um, panelists tonight a moment to say their uh, final thoughts and uh, to wrap up this evening. But it has been such a joy to work with the three of them and to be able to bring this to you during our homecoming. So with that, I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you. I'm so uh, honored to have been a part of this uh, virtual homecoming, and um, for all of the um, for all the attendees, I just um, say just remember that everybody has a story to tell, and try everyone just try to get out of your own box and watch uh, movies with people that don't look like you, people that don't sound like you. Um, people that don't do what you do for a living and just try to experience since we can't really go out yet and, 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 and engage in each other uh, face to face, watch a film that you wouldn't norm normally uh, see um, on a regular basis that, and you'd be very surprised that you have more in common than you think. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everyone that attended also. Like, I can't tell you. And what a joy it was to work with these three individuals. Um, I think David said, we learned so much from each other. We giggled, we laughed. But I think that was very emblematic of the topic. And I agree with both of you. I think movies will always be here. 
how we watch them may change. It may be that phones become a part of an interactive experience in the movies. I know David looks at me like, no, don't even say things like that. But as they evolve, I think we will evolve with them. But those stories and those people that Sean were talking about will always be central to it. And I think that is the part that's like really special in that what we hung on to even in the pandemic through streaming. Well, and I too wanna to thank all of you for being here uh, with us, sharing this, being the excuse for this wonderfully guilty pleasure that uh, it's been for me to be part of this. And uh, I, I think keep sharing the things you love with the people you love and even the people you don't know. I think things can only get better if we continue to share what we love and really be in real genuine conversations with each other. I've changed my mind on a few things as a result of our, uh, our project together and I'm gonna have uh, some withdrawal when it's over. So thank you, be well. We'll see you at the next homecoming. And Serena, thank you for making this all happen. Terrific, nice job. Thank you. Peace.